I'm Suzanne Mills Wozniak, Extension Educator, Agriculture and Natural Resources in Montgomery County. And we are going to be talking about getting started in a new farm or small farm enterprise. My colleague is Chris Penrose, and I'm an Extension Educator over in uh, Morgan County. I do Ag and Natural Resources. Suzanne and I have um, talked about this uh, this topic for uh, for years now. And uh, we, uh, we really like to share this. Um, our goal is, is to help you to uh, avoid mistakes, kind of uh, get some plans down on paper, really go out and um, assess uh, what you have, what you want to do, how you can end up marketing your things and see if all of those can come together to, to allow you to have a successful operation. So we're going to talk a little bit about evaluating resources uh, today, goal setting and um, some uh, business planning. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. So. One of the first things we'd like to uh, discuss is, um, is um, you know, what type of resources do you have? And we're going to start off today talking a little bit about some land resources. What are available? Is the land that you have compatible with what you want to do? Can we make those things mesh and uh, get together? So we'd like to start off with is, um, you know, how much land do you have? And, and don't let that be a deterrent to you because you can... I've seen people make almost $100,000 an acre per year off an acre of land. So um, if, um, if you're really wanting to uh, become intensive and uh, you have the desire to do that, you can, you can certainly make it happen. But you need to have the right type of land. Uh, so the one thing that we want to start off trying to figure out is how many acres of tillable land do you have? Uh, typically, that's a slope that is less than 6% where we can work up the ground, maybe put in some annual crops of uh, some type. And then if you have hillier ground, you can generally make hay off of ground where it's a more permanent type situation on slopes that are less than 20%, but that does get pretty steep. And then, you know, if you have some rough ground or something like that, or what type of ground do you have that's available for pastures if you wanted to raise some, some type of uh, livestock. And then let's don't over, overlook our woodlots. Do you have woods? Do you have some land that you'd like to go into woods? Um, and uh, there are definitely some opportunities for for that as well so if we start off talking about cropland i want to ask you what type of uh, what was the last crop on that field because that could be a, a factor in, the, in uh, deciding what you want to um, uh, start off growing uh, what system of production do you want to have do you want to have a conventional do you want to have organic i typically like to tell people if you want to be organic you're going to really have an advantage if you have real good um, uh, fertility right now because trying to build up fertility if it's very low and be or organic, it can be done, but it definitely is a is a challenge. Um, we also want you to make sure that you go out and soil test to find out where where it's at. We want you to check your pH, which is a measure of acidity, uh, because if it's too acid, it's going to be hard to try to grow anything out there. And uh, when you're out looking at your ground, um, you know, take a look and see what's growing there now. Um, are there any indicator plants? Uh, a good example. Um, would be um, poverty grass, which is an indicator of low phosphorus, uh, maybe a uh, low pH. Uh, those are some things that, that we can look at now. Also like to look at weeds. Are there some real problem weeds out there or, or some problem plants that may need to uh, be addressed before we do much more? Uh, if you're looking at raising animals, uh, one of the biggest factors is what type of fence um, do you need? What type of fence is there, if, um, if any, if you have some fence, um, is it compatible with the livestock that you want to raise? Is it a type of fence that you're going to be comfortable with? Um, and, um, and woodlands, this is an interesting one. There's at least a couple farms in Morgan County a year that sell. And the people that are astute and buys that is able to pay off the entire mortgage with the value of the timber on the woodlot. So, so you really want to get a handle on, um, on what type of uh, trees that you have growing. Uh, what do you want to do with them? And... Um, and uh, what's the quality and um, you know what are, what are some of the options because if you do want to make some harvest uh, there there could be some potential there um, maybe uh, maybe you want to um, to um, utilize the, uh, the the woodlands and not harvest them maybe maybe grow some um, some um, some crops like ginseng or maybe maple syrup production or something like that so um, you know don't 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 discount those options kind of on another topic, one of the biggest things that could be a hindrance for you trying to start an operation is water. 
you may be fortunate where your um, where your lands at that you have an adequate amount of groundwater. You may have access to uh, to public water, so it may not be as as much of an issue. But um, if you do not have those, um, what are some other sources out there? Could be something like ponds or springs or cisterns, which is um, big tanks where you collect the water off your roofs. You'd be amazed how much water that you can get from them. Um, from something like that. If you're gonna utilize creeks or streams, are they seasonal or, or, um, or do they run year round? If you're gonna raise livestock, are you gonna bring the livestock to the water or take the water to the livestock? Um, some of our better grazers have, have learned that taking the water out to the livestock is a way that's gonna make a lot more money. So raising livestock quite often, the biggest issue may not be fenced, it, um, it may be water. And then whether you're growing crops, you're raising livestock or whatever, wildlife is a major issue. It can be an advantage, it can be a disadvantage. I've seen three acre fields of corn totally taken out by, by deer. Um, raccoons, groundhogs can go in and, um, and just rip out crops of tomatoes and other plants like that. One of the biggest things um, if, um, if you're raising crops is to make sure the, the wildlife never gets in there in the first place, which may require some type of fencing whether it's a physical barrier or a psychological barrier like electric fence. And then does your property have any, well, let me even back up just a second. Um, if you have a lot of wildlife, are there some options like lease hunting out the farm? Or if you're raising an orchard, maybe having some lease hunts, um, lease hunting out there to, uh, to try to control the wildlife. I've seen some real good farmers maybe have orchards uh, they, um, they graze between the trees with the sheep. You have to watch out for different pesticides that you use. And then um, they actually uh, build cabins and, uh, and, um, and lease out the farm for, for hunting. So there's a lot of opportunities out there. And then does your location have any unique features to it? Like if you're gonna be raising some, um, some uh, crops that um, you would be selling at the farmer's market, um, if you're along a major highway, could you actually have a market there um, right right out along the highway where, where you can sell products. Um, you know, there are some people that may have a, a gas well on the property, which would lend itself to maybe having a greenhouse or something like that. And then there's buildings. Um, with whatever enterprise you're gonna do, do you need buildings? Do you already have buildings? Can you convert buildings that you have into something that, that, um, that you may be wanting to do? I've seen some folks convert milk houses into cabins for for uh, lease, lease hunting and, and things like that. And then whatever enterprise you're gonna get into, what type of equipment are you gonna need? And I really like to challenge you, depending where you're at in your stage of life financially and, um, and uh, your physical condition, are you able to exchange some, um, some, cap, some uh, capital for labor? Uh, instead of buying a rototiller, will a hoe work? Um, you know, something something like that, because the more you can put into an enterprise when you get started with your operation, the more you can put back into something that makes money, like buying more cattle or buying more seeds, the more it's going to compound itself over the years and build your net worth as time goes on. So with that, Suzanne, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I think you're going to talk a little bit about some more on uh, labor and management and things like that. Thank you, Chris. Yes. Labor and management are one of the most important things when we start looking at uh, a new farm operation or expanding one. Uh, what kind of labor is required? What kind of management is going to be required? Is it gonna be hand labor or do we need the machinery that Chris was talking about? Can we get by with just our own personal labor? Are the labor requirements the same throughout uh, the year and the seasons? If we're doing a farmer's market, we're going to be extremely busy in the summer um, and late early fall. If that's the case, then are we going to be able to take the summer vacations that we always want to take? How's that going to be spread out? Um, what are we going to do? And most important, one of the most important things is does uh, how often do you need to be on site? If we can, if we're raising livestock, we really need to be there at least once a day to check those livestock, the livestock to make sure that the feed and the water are there and no, nobody is injured. If we're raising fruits and vegetables, yeah, during the prime pollinating season, do we need to be out there checking to make sure that the pollination is going correctly and that there are no pests in there? We really need to start thinking about some of that. But 
we also need to think is this farm operation that we are planning going to mesh with the lifestyle that we have or the lifestyle that we want? That's a major issue. Um, when we're looking at that, we're looking also at the different types of land use that we have. Is our land um, and the location of it uh, good for aquaponics? Is it better for crop production or is it better for grazing? Do we want to do a nursery? Do we love to grow plants for um, people to plant? And do we want to sell them? Do we have that? Fruit, veggie production, uh, closer to the cities. Um, we're looking at some agritourism. Do we have wedding, in my area of Montgomery County, do we have wedding venues? A lot of people want to go outside and a nice big barn is a really attractive place to go. Um, we also have a lot of boarding of horses in our area. Um, is that something that, that is conducive to what we have? Um, also, we also need to figure out what are the startup costs? Do we actually have access to land? Enough, access, enough land to make it profitable, to make it worthwhile for the venture? And as Chris alluded to, what are our financial resources? Um, do we have that money available to spend? Or are we going to have to go borrow it from a, a bank or someplace like that? And what we're doing, is it therapeutic for us or is it a profitable venture that we want to go on to? Is it something that can be profitable? Is it going to, is there a market for it? It goes back to the old widget things. I can make a lot of widgets, but if nobody wants to buy that widget, I just have them all stacked up in my barn and it never goes anywhere. If I have livestock um, and nobody wants to buy that type of livestock, I, they're going to eat me out of house and home before they. We, I get rid of them, I sell them. So we need to think about that. And again, it comes back to what do you want to do? Because there's nothing worse than having to sell your child's 4-H project that they got attached to because you, you can't keep it anymore. It's not there. You also have to think of why are you doing this? And you really need to have a good conversation with yourself. Why do I want to do this? Is it possible? Am I physically able to do what I want to do? And do I have the financial resources to do it? And once you have that conversation with yourself, you really need to bring in other family members who are going to be involved in this or business partners, potential business partners. So you have the same conversation that you're going to have. There's nothing worse than starting a project or a farming operation and assuming, making the assumption that your kids really want to be involved in this. And you're depending on them for help and they'd rather be at a basketball game or they really want you at their basketball game and you're stuck out in the barn um, milking a cow or out cultivating corn. Do you have the time to do this? A lot of us think of farming as a secondary operation, a retirement job. Um, if you're still working, do you really have the time to devote, to put in to it, uh, to build that operation? And we look at what are you good at? If you are really a people person, if you're a good salesperson, then maybe you need to consider a market, a farmer's market, like Chris said, um, or a farm market, it's your site. But again, it only comes back to the fact, is your site a good location for a on-farm market? What's gonna be the attraction to get people there? Are you good at producing just one product? Are you good at growing uh, ferns? If you're good at growing ferns and you really don't want to deal with people, can you find a secondary buyer for that who can buy your product at a profit for you and then turn around and make a profit for him, themselves by selling it to someone else. There's a lot of different things that we need to look at when we're starting that. We also need to look at what are our costs? We have either variable or fixed cost. Fixed costs are something like the taxes, uh, the insurance on a property, depreciation costs if you have to lease equipment. 
Those are all fixed costs that any operation has to have, and we usually need to have those for startup. Variable costs, how many, how much ground are you going to put in seed? How much, how many tomato plants are you going to grow? What kind of fertilizer? Going back to Chris's uh, statement of, we really need to soil test. How much fertilizer are we going to have to apply? And again, if some of these costs, um, we have to have hired labor, we're gonna to have to pay them. We're gonna to have to pay some maybe taxes, social security taxes on those uh, hired employees. We really need to start looking at what we can do and how to do it. One of the major things that we are going to really have to figure out is do we have access to the land that we need to do what, to implement what we want to do, what is in our plan? Do we have the money to buy it? Going back to what Chris said, what kind of equipment can we use? All those different things figure into this operation and we need to think about what's there. If we've got already have land, do we have the buildings? Going back to what Chris said about making um, buildings uh, for venues for uh, the public events. Again, but that also brings in some insurance and some other things that we need to look at. Um, where's this farm, where's this land located? Is there a natural attraction that you can build upon? Do you have some synergistic effects with um, your neighbors? Uh, can you mutually work together? What's the competition? Is there a competition out there that you need? And does the farm really match your interest? Is it something you want to do or is it something that somebody thinks you want, need to be doing? It all comes back to what is your responsibility and how do you want to see this go? Go. It's the vision you have for your farm. So Chris, I'm going to turn it back to you. Um, this is this is typically the uh, point of, the, of, of our talk where I'm gonna try to give kind of like a little motivational speech. I've been doing this for 32 years and uh, Suzanne, I know you've been doing it for, for quite a while. And as I've gone out and worked with farmers over the years, there's there's one thing that, that I've really noticed. There's a much stronger tendency for someone to succeed, especially someone that's getting started. If they've developed them, them, uh, their, their selves, a, a, a mission statement. And, um, and I've seen some that's been very successful. I've seen it as I walk into their home. I know when my dad worked at one of the local pharmacies, they had a mission statement right when you went into the door. Um, it's always going to help keep you focused on what you need to be doing. And, um, um, and you may be asking yourself, well, how am I gonna develop a mission statement? Well, let's think of it two ways. I'm gonna start off by asking your, having you ask yourself two questions. And when you can answer those two questions, I think you'll be able to develop a mission statement. One is, where do you see yourself in 10 years? And then secondly, what's the most important thing in the world to you? Um, that's basically developing or utilizing your vision and your values. And when you put those together, um, it can help you make a, a mission statement. And Suzanne and I have been talking about this for golly, I don't know how long. And it's been interesting as I've done these talks, you know, actually my mission statement has has changed a a, 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 a little bit over, over the years. But when you're developing a mission statement and setting goals, it's all part of the planning process. Um, successful operations uh, go through the control organization planning uh, process and uh, controlling and um, this planning uh, process is is where some of our goals and um, and missions uh, come together at so when I start when I mention about our vision and values I'll, I'll, I'll kind of briefly talk about values you know the way you figure out what your values is is really it, it's it's about what you believe in they can be personal they can be religious uh, they can they can be a, be a business oriented. Um, some indicators of uh, your values may be your goals or purposes, your aspirations, your attitudes, your feelings, your beliefs, convictions, um, worries, obstacles, problems that you may have. All of those are uh, potentially indicators of what some are um, of, um, of what your um, your uh, values are. And your vision is is something that that um, that you want become. So when you put your vision and your values together, that's what's going to help you um, develop a mission statement. And a mission statement is that one tool that establishes broad overall direction 
uh, for your for your business. It's that fundamental underlying reason why you are you are in the business, and probably most importantly, it clarifies what you should be doing. So you know, one thing that I encourage you to do is is if you do develop one, keep it brief and concise. Keep it down to um, to one critical purpose. So as you're thinking about one, ask yourself, what are you in business to do? What you'd like your business to be? The values you choose as the foundation of your business, and most importantly, the importance of the uh, people that's involved. That can be your family, your neighbors, it can be your employees, it can be your customers, any of that stuff. <clears throat> Let me give you an example. This here is of my farm. Uh, in the background, you see a picture of my farm. It's it's. It's a seventh generation farm. My family bought it off the federal government back in 1824. My boys are seventh generation on it. And I do raise livestock and it's a forage based operation. So the uh, mission of um, my farm is, or my business is to provide supplemental income by marketing quality livestock with a minimum effort because my job as an extension educator is my top um, um, priority after my faith in my family. And, um, and then, um, do that with minimum effort and cost while maintaining the family farm for the next generation. So that's a good example of what mine is. Let me just give you a, um, a another one here. And this one is, is to build mutually profitable business uh, friendships. And if you think about it, I've heard people over the years say it's a bank, it's something like that. Well, they're close. It's actually a cooperative that I dealt with when I worked up in, um, in um, Northwest Ohio. I want you to develop this mission statement then um, that's the hard part. Then the next thing you want to do is, um, is set up some, um, some objectives. Objectives are general, observable, um, challenging and untimed. So for example, on my farm, um, I'd like to raise uh, better quality livestock. I'd like to have better forages. I'd like to spend more time with my family. Um, I want to be able to raise, um, heirloom tomatoes. Uh, those are all some, some, um, objectives that that you uh, may may have um, some other sample ones that I've thought of over the years is uh, paying off debt by generating additional income increase the amount of produce to market improve quality of livestock spend more time with my family determine once for needs and then once you develop three to five objectives then you can set specific goals goals are what we call um, um, smart uh, their statements of what is to be done to complete your objectives. They're specific, they're measurable, they're attainable, they're rewarding their time. For example, I may wanna set out 500 uh, tomato plants and sell them at the local uh, farmer's market by the 1st of September. Um, um, I may wanna get the, uh, the uh, fence built on the back 40 by May 31st. I wanna set the bull out by June 5th. Um, I wanna get up 300 uh, round bales of hay by the end of the season. You know, those are those are some goals. So once they're accomplished, you can have some sense of satisfaction that that um, you've gotten done what you want to do. But it may not only be the business. Another one could be have my son say, take two uh, two 4-H projects um, this 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 year. And just some additional thoughts then on objectives and goals. I like to when I'm determining what to do because sometimes there's more to do than what I have time. I like to um, divide things up into no cost, low cost or high cost. That'll help me decide what to do. I want you to take time to communicate. I want you to prioritize things. Prioritize your faith, your family, your health, your job, and get and maintain control of finances, lifestyles, and other things. That'll help you be much more successful. But my final thought here is, Suzanne, is plan, plan, and replan. But at some point you gotta do. Don't be afraid of making a mistake. The only ones that make mis uh, that don't make mistakes are ones that don't do anything. Uh, when I was in high school, my industrial arts teacher said, Chris, it's a poor carpenter that can't fix his own mistakes. So um, uh, we're definitely bound to, to make mistakes, but um, hopefully you can learn from them and make you more successful. So with that, Suzanne, I'm gonna turn it over to you and um, let you take it on from here. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, you are correct in a lot of your observations. Um, in the course of our farming operation, we're in Southwest Ohio. That plan that we have started on has changed numerous times. And it's usually changed with a lifestyle or a life, a life event. And so we do need to have plans. Um, 
no plan is etched in stone and not changeable. We really need to be able to change these plans. We need to be able to uh, adapt as we have done this year with COVID and last year. We need to be able to adapt and swing markets. Um, a lot of our producers, smaller producers in Southwest Ohio had, were selling to a lot of restaurants last year. And when the restaurant closed for COVID, they had to change their marketing plan. They had to be able to adapt and move it forward. But again, you still have to have this plan. You have to know that you have land access. You have to know what your costs are. Uh, you have to know what your family's desire is because every you're in this, usually small farm operations are a family operation. And so families are involved and you really have to have a plan. Um, but there's also one plan that we really never like to talk about. That's the exit plan. When do we know it's enough? When are we no longer capable of doing the job that we wanted to do, the mission that we had? When are we no longer able to do it either physically or financially? We have to be able to look at that and make that decision that it is changing. Um, we need that exit plan. Um, we need to talk with adjoining farmers. How do we do, you know, is there a mutual way we can work together? Um, with land access, especially for our newer and younger farmers, it's going to sound uh, a little bit morbid, but we really need to start reading some of the obituaries, what's happening in the area. If I wanna get started, uh, I'm going to want to know what's in my area, what's, what land is going to possibly be available. Because when we look at things right now, we're looking at a good third of the farmland in the United States changing hands within the next five to 15 years. So there's opportunities out there, but there are opportunities if you have a plan, if you're ready to go. You need to be able to have, if you're a small farmer and you need land, you need to have that written portfolio uh, that you can go out and sell yourself. And that comes back to the, again, the mission and vision and goals that Chris talked about, because if you're looking for land, you have to be able to sell it, sell yourself to the people who own that land, who have that opportunity. But again, if you already have the land, you need that same type of plan and written documents to talk to the bankers, to potential lenders. Um, and this is not a stagnant plan. You've got to review it and update it at least once a year at the minimum because things change markets change people's lives change uh sometimes there's a life a life event that nobody had planned for and that can turn a farm operation upside down very quickly if we haven't planned for it and you can find um i'm not really going to talk about some of the all the components of a business plan that's available out there. OSU has uh, business plans, how you develop them, how you do, how you develop the marketing plan, the financial plans, how you're looking at those, those documents and those spreadsheets are out there. And a lot of them are fill in the blank for you, but you have to know your own costs. And you need to have that written plan. A lot of the bankers right now, if you're borrowing money, are going to want to see this these balance sheets. They're going to want to see how much, what you think your marketing plan is going to be, what you think your yield is going to be. Um, again, you have to structure your operation. Uh, a lot of different tax uh, incentives um, that you need to look at. Are you going to be a sole proprietorship? Is it going to be a partnership? Is it going to be an LLC? All of these are business decisions that you need to address right now and handle it. and risk management how are we going to handle the risk uh, are we going to be able to move forward with it and one of the things that for some of the smaller farmers we need to do is look at uh, the census uh, if we're going to be selling in near a city i've got to plan my marketing strategy to fit the needs of that consumer that is sitting in that area. 
it's not going to do me any good to say I'm going to sell 10 pounds of tomatoes each week to X number of people if there are not enough people in that census area to do it. I really need to know what's around me, what's happening. Financial statements, again, everything's sitting there. Um, you really have to know what you're doing. You have to put these plans together. Um, can't stress enough the need to plan. Like Chris and I have said, and I've said, you need to look at your resources. You need to look at yourself. You need to look at your family. Um, what do you want to do? Because you can make, if you can dream it, you can make it happen. But there are going to be sacrifices along the way, and there's going to have to be some plans along the way. So, Chris, what else would you have to say? I think you're hitting it um, um, pretty good. But the ones that kind of put that business plan together, you know, that does some uh, projections, ones that have the ability to um, to uh, withstand the initial startup costs and be able to survive till they start generating income. You know, the example is if you're starting an orchard, it may be seven, eight years before you generate money. If I'm starting with baby calves, I'm going to sell some fat animals to, to, to the market. It may be two years before I start getting money. So um, if you don't plan for that early on, it's going to set you back so much that you may not be able to uh, to uh, pull out forward. But you also bring up that great point, Suzanne, is you need to make sure that you have a market for what you want to raise. And, um, and uh, if you don't, you're in trouble. But if you do, uh, you can you can really uh, start making some hay with that. Correct. You have to be in the right place at the right time with the right product. And the only way you get there is to plan and make sure that you know what your costs are, that you know where your market's going to be, and you pay attention to the current marketing conditions. And there's one thing none of us can really control unless we're in inside production. And that's the weather, because Mother Nature is always going to throw us a curveball that we had not anticipated, and it disrupts our plans. That's why we have to be reviewing these plans regularly. Um, it's a must to be successful and to be around like you are for the seventh generation. I don't, I think we're at the sixth generation on our farm, but it for both of us to succeed at this area end of it, there had to be some planning in long ago for to make it where we could continue to continue to farm. And those opportunities are out there for the newer and smaller farmer. It's just you've got to take, you've got to learn and never be afraid to say, like you say, Chris, if you don't try, you may fail, but you've learned from that failure and you can move forward. Yep. Couldn't agree more. And and I guess one of one of my final thoughts are, and this is really one that I've thought about over the years. Um, if your operation has a 10% profit margin, a lot of people think the only way that they can double their income is double in size. But I'll challenge you this. If you had the ability to cut costs by 10%, did you just not double the amount of money you made? Um, um, if you're able, if you're a good marketer and you're able to sell it for only 10% more, Maybe I'm not just selling lettuce now. Maybe I'm selling gourmet lettuce. Maybe I'm not selling hay. Maybe I'm selling horse hay. If I can sell it for 10% more, that I just not double my profit. Um, Correct. So, you know, and then if you put those together, you've tripled your profit. So uh, there's, there, there's a lot more ways than just expanding to make more money. That's for sure. Correct. But you also have to go back to your location, location, location and make your farm enterprise fit that location and that land. Without question. In Southwest Ohio, we couldn't be raising our cattle at a profit when we have the good flat ground to grow corn, soybeans, tomatoes, um, some of the higher dollar crops. So again, it comes back to location, 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 and plan, plan, plan. And then replan. The world's constantly changing, and we need to as well. So, um, if anybody ever has any questions, I know Suzanne and I would love to uh, to handle uh, any questions you have. I know Suzanne's uh, email is Mills Dash Wozniak, uh, W A S N I A K dot one at osu.edu. I'm Penrose dot one at osu.edu. 
Dot one means either we have strange names or we've been around a long time or both. So it really has been a pleasure talking with all of you today. And um, if you ever have questions, we'd love to hear from you. And we wish you all the success in your new farming operation or expanding the existing farming operation. Thank you.